Bom dia, everyone. That's my only text in Portuguese this morning. But um, good morning, everyone, and I greet especially the great panel that was sitting behind the table. I was listening to you, I was impressed uh, also with your passion uh, to work for this country, for the best of this country. Uh, I feel honored and also hum humbled that I'm standing here to um, present to you the, the main thesis of my book, Moral Capital. And uh, yeah, I feel really privileged to be here with you this morning. Um, I'm living in Amsterdam. Um, I served uh, my country in Parliament for 12 years as a senator. Uh, for my party, which is Christian political party, which is currently also now in the government. And um, it's my first time in Brazil. So I'm learning Portuguese now. Yeah? And um, the, the way I always watched Brazil is also through the screen when I was watching the World Cup football championships. And then the Dutch played against the Brazilian team. It was so creative and what I remember is that we always lost from the Brazilian team. But I believe we won one time a couple of years ago. But okay, we forget that. Yeah? Um, but I'm really privileged and honored to be here with you. I speak a little slowly, but that's because of the request of the translators. They don't, don't speak too fast. Therefore, um, we are here because there's a translation of my book, Moral capital. It's here, it's at the back. This is the Dutch edition from a couple of years ago. I have it here with me. And I wrote that book uh, out of concern. And some people in the panel already mentioned something about it, and the concern about our societies. I'm talking about our, uh, let's say, our Western civilization, our modern societies. And I consider this world, and the world in Europe and in America, both Americas, to belong to this civilization. So we're talking about the problems in our culture. And I, I, I'm convinced that they have the same shape here as they have in Europe. And my intention writing this book was um, the question how to rebuild, how to reshape society once we rediscover the moral basis of it, which is forgotten, that's what I believe, which is forgotten in our modern age. We forgot that we are moral beings, we forgot that the, the way we live together is a moral thing. So therefore I wrote this book, and uh, now it's translated, and we're going to talk about it this morning, and this afternoon, and also tomorrow, I believe. Well, the structure of what I'm going to do is this. Um, I was asked to give first an analysis. That's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to get a coffee break, and then I'm going to say more about the concept of moral capital. So it's first a negative part, the analysis of what's going on, and then after the coffee break, I come to my more positive thesis. Yeah, so what moral co capital and what can that do? What does it mean? And always I'm busy with public policies. So I've been a politician, I'm still a politician, I'm thinking about public policies. Um, how to work to, um, um, in order to get cohesion between people, to get integration in a, in a society, to integrate a nation. In my hotel, I found on the table in the lobby a copy of your constitution. I tried to read it, so that was my second lesson in Portuguese. I tried to read it. And then I saw in the preamble many things about integration, I believe. There's the, the word integration of a, of a nation and cohesion and all that kind of things. But that's what we are talking about. And do we have public policies in order to promote it, to reach that? OK, so this is to introduce myself and the topic in the book. Let's start here. This is uh, a window in New York, in the building of the United Nations. It's the peace window of Mark Chagall. 
perhaps some of you have been in the building when you en enter it to the right you have this this is it has a prominent place in the united nations building in new york it's made by the famous uh, artist mark chagall and what you see here it's a detail what you see here are happy people people that live together in happiness it's a sort of picture of shalom of living together in righteousness, in peace, in goodness together. Well, it's a, of course, it's a picture, it's an idea. But Marc Chagall's paintings and glasses, his stained glass windows, are full, well, of opposites, of course, uh, but al always there is this, this element of shalom, this element of living together peacefully, as we should desire to live together. So let me start there. I assume that we all, we all, that we, um, each of us, we want a meaningful and good life in relation to others who are meaningful to us. We want such a life that is flourishing. We want a flourishing community. We want to be part of flourishing communities and that is what makes us happy. And I show this stained glass window to start there, with this desire, this longing of every one of us, each of each and one of us, to live such a flourishing, happy life. That's where we are after. And saying this, I think it's a sort of universal thing, saying this implies something about how we view ourselves. It says something about our human nature. Some elements. What does it say about our human nature? First, we cannot reach such a flourishing life on our own. We need others. We live to go together with others. Here's the term symbiosis. Not liberally, it says we live together with others. And we need others in order to get such a happy life together with others. The term is already introduced by Sergio, is from John Althusius, and his work in the 17th century is based on, on this insight, that we, we live together in symbiosis together with others. And we cannot live on our own, we cannot reach this happy state on our own. Look to a baby, look to a child, it cannot grow up without others. And so it remains that all our life we need one another in a deep way to get a good life. Secondly, it says about ourselves that the human person is a partner, a friend, a relative to others. We are, what Aristotle said, a zoon political. We are a social being. We are social beings. So that's that's our human nature. And thirdly it says about us that we'd like to build a moral commonwealth. I mention it, I call it this way. we like to build a house together where it is good living, a community, a nation which can be a moral commonwealth where we share values and morals in order to work together, to partner, to cooperate, and to develop our society. Well, the crisis of today, the crisis of today is that the social fabric of our world is falling apart. The, cri the social crisis of today, I, there are all kinds of crises we can talk about. I focus on society, I focus on how we live together as a people, and what, where our moral basis comes from. But the crisis, the social crisis of today is that the social fabric of our world is far falling apart. Family structures, communities, nations are under pressure. It's not only here, we heard some examples, it's also in my country. It's sort of modern, um, modern feature uh, that social structures, communities, families, they're under pressure and they tend to fall apart. But we do our best, of course. We do our best to repair and to reshape where we can. But there are forces 
of modernization destroying our social structures day by day. We sense, we as citizens of this world, we sense somehow that our world in that respect is not in order. It's fragmented. So people are really pessimistic, becoming very pessimistic about our time and about our world, our social world. They think we are in a decline together. And it starts somehow with the social fa fabric that no longer holds. And this causes all kinds of feelings and uncertainties. And people feel uncertain about the social world around it. There is a lack of trust in others. Right? In a personal way, we, we deal with a lack of trust. We don't know who can be trusted when people become strangers of one another. So that's an aspect. Another aspect is that we, when we don't know one another closely anymore, we tend to exclude people. Right? Our labor market and our culture are excluding people. It's one of the problems of our time exclusion and polarization between groups of people. We also struggle with a lack of confidence in the institutions, the political, financial, economic institutions of our world. Are they in control? Are they doing the right thing? Working for the public benefit or for their personal goals? So I heard about the panel talking about common good and the public benefit are the institutions in our world geared uh, to work for that? Or are they filled with people who are working for the personal benefit? So that's a big issue. Some people um, throw, uh, some people turn their back to the systems. They become anti-system. They turn their back to the authorities, to the elites, they accuse them of betraying the people. So that's all coming out of lack of trust, uh, uh, of uncertainty, feelings of fear. And a lot of, the, of modern behavior has a background in fear. People fear one of them, fear what's coming, they fear the future. And sometimes, I think I have to go further with this, Sometimes um, people are really people are really shocked by what happens in their world. Therefore, we have the term moral panic. I don't know whether you've heard about that, but there is a term that, that says there's moral panic. Moral panic is the shock, the situation, the fear that something is really going wrong, that the, that the moral fabric of your world is not in order. When we had an attacks in New York at 9-11, uh, uh, um, people wondered what was going on in their world. Why do they do such things to us? Why are people attacking us? They didn't understand anymore the behavior of others. So that sometimes you, there are occasions you don't understand the behavior of others uh, and you think when they go on, our world will fall apart. So that's moral panic. We today have also what we might call ecological panic. That's the panic that our ecological systems, not only the natural ecological system, but also the social ecological systems, fall apart, that they decline. Um, I sense among the young people in Europe, also in my uh, in my, in my surroundings, in, in, my, in my world in, in, in the Netherlands, young people in their 20s or some, sometimes teenagers, they're very pessimistic about the future. They're very pessimistic about the institutions that should govern us. And they think, because of all these things about global warming, etc., and insufficient actions, they think that the world will decline and will be gone in 50 or 100 years. So that's ecological panic. I take that term not for, let's say, the climate things or the natural things, but also for society. There's also an eco ecological system. There's a moral ecology to be taken care of. 
And if we don't take care of this moral ecology, things will fall apart. There is a book uh, a couple of years ago, Barbara, Barbara Ehrenreich, uh, with the title Fear of Falling. And she was writing about the middle class that was in fear that it would fall, that it, that it wouldn't remain and sustain their position. Okay, what are the forces behind this? So now I described fragmentation, feelings of uncertainty, um, the idea that the world is not in order, uh, perhaps in, in real danger. So how did we come this far? How did we come at this point? What's going on? My analysis is that this is a sort of heritage of modernization. It's a sort of result of a way we have been looking for many, many years, for decades, for ages, to our world, and now we're paying the price. Now we see what's going really wrong. And I point to three forces, what they call forces of modernization, um, that caused sort of moral lack, lack of morality, uh, uh, moral oblivion. The first, I, I want to be very brief about this, is you can read it in the book, there are three chapters dealing with these three forces. First is what I call, hopefully the next will come, yeah. First, what, what I would call is utopian thinking. It's the idea in the beginning of the modern period that we have um, the best that we can organize as human beings to come in the future. The future is here in this world, it's on this earth. Uh, utopian thinking means we project what we desire in the future and we think we can reach that future through our work, through uh, the way we do politics, the way we do science and ethics, etc. There's a lot to say about this. I want to be very brief. My point is that when you are busy with the future in this way, believing in utopias that are not here but there, then there's a sort of neglect of the present, a sort of neglect of what you have to do now and here. And you see that in the, the strongest utopian thinkers, they um, apply force and abuse and violence against the present. So the present must become the past because we have a future to organize with one another. But the, here starts a sort of moral neglect. So you are entitled, um, it's your right to be so busy with the future that you neglect your responsibilities and your moral uh, obligations for one another now and here. And I believe you're always placed now and here. We have responsibilities for one another now and here, for you and for me, for my family, for things we have to do now. That's what you think, of course, when you talk about, you know, now you're thinking about this government, you have to do things now and here, you have to do your responsibilities now and here. Not in, don't believe in the utopia, you have to do your things now. So that's the first, it's a sort of moral neglect because we think we have to progress to something else. No, we have to be here. And the second is, it's, a, it's a, a more common idea, of course, that uh, um, through modern science, and it's a process of ages again, we don't believe anymore that our moral instructions are there, that we can find our morality let's say, in nature, in the things that are given to us. The development of modern science went this way, that in many steps, through the Enlightenment to today, after all people believed that what we think morally is just our own thinking, it's just our own design. We decide, and we design for moral attitudes, or moral principles. They are not given, they're not given in the cosmos, or in the world order, or in nature, but we design through science. Through science is, has been our guide to develop a new world order 
which is really a human in the sense of individual intellectual <coughs> human beings. Um, I, I, I think you are more or less familiar with this idea that after a long period of subjectification, we believe we are the source of our own moral life. There's no one outside us saying to us what we have to do. Um, so science, in a way, has made a fence between us and nature. So we're looking to our own systems, our own ideas, our own rationale. But there is a fence. We made a fence between us and nature. We are no longer informed what to do, what is good, when we look around in this world and we, we want to learn from what is given. I believe as a Christian was given also in creation. That this world is not uh, a disorder, the world is in creation is given as an order and also conveys um, sort of moral insights. The third force um, I'm talking about is individualization. Um, also here you have a process of ages um, with the result that in the end we consider the human person as an individual. It was not normal many ages ago to, to start with the human person as an individual. We started with community or we started with someone's place in the bigger order or in the cosmos or whatever. Now we consider ourselves in the first place as an individual. Uh, that has good sides. Uh, we need to be an individual in this way that we are responsible persons. I always say all education wants to reach that point that we have an individual taking care of his or her own life as a responsible person, so that's good. But what I mean here is a, a kind of individualization with the result that someone says, I decide myself, I'm autonomous, I decide what's good for me, I decide perhaps also what's good for you, I go my own way. There are social scientists who have described this, like the German Ulrich Beck, uh, the same author about risk society, but I'm not going to talk about risk society now. I did it already a bit when I talked about moral and ecological panic, but uh, Beck talked and analyzed uh, this process of individualization. Together with Anthony Giddens, as an important British social scientist, they say this, roughly this. Okay, you have in our modern times emancipation. Emancipation means um, that you can be free as an individual to have your life. And so we get emancipation of slaves, emancipation of women, etc. So they're no longer bound, no longer in a sort of no longer imprisoned, but free to have your life. That's emancipation. No authorities above you who say how you have to live. You can live your own life. It's a sort of subjectification. And then they say, in the context of modern welfare states, people are also considered to be an individual uh, in, in this regard, that they, they are dealt with as individuals for the law and in all kinds of government welfare programs. Uh, it's individualized. Then you can say there's a sort of institutional individualization. You're taken as an individual for the law uh, in public health care, uh, etc. So that strengthens again the idea. That you, are, that you are the person, that you are an individual to be dealt with. Then um, we have the next step, and that's the step, let's say, in post-industrial, post-modern societies. And here comes Anthony Giddens with his analysis. He's saying there's a new sort of individualization going on in our time, on top of what I said uh, before, and that says, 
that we, with all the means that we have in the world, want to have our own life, and this is what he calls self-actualization. And he connects this also with globalization, because through globalization, we can reach any good anywhere on the world. So we go on the internet, that's what the information highway is there, we go on the internet, and we can connect with anyone, we can communicate with anyone, but we can also buy the goods or whatever that we want. So we can design the type of life in this world that we really want to have. So we, there's a sort of self-actualization, you want to position yourselves in the world as an individual. Not per se as a Brazilian, perhaps, or as a Dutch guy, or whatever, but just as a person on the internet who can design and take over an identity that you want. So ident identities become fluid because you can design it yourselves. Don't you see that around you? That identities become fluid. You can structure yourself, build the identity that you want. There are people who go on the internet and they find people around the world who are like them. And they say, I belong to that community. I don't longer be belong to the community I come from, but now I'm part of a worldwide community of people who like the same things as I do, etc. This process calls Anthony Giddens the process of disembedding. So this way of self-actualization goes along with disembedding, which means you get up out of your beddings where you come from, yeah? so you pull out where you have your roots, and you belong to a new sort of community with the people you like, you choose. This, this, this new individualization goes along with the process of disembedding. And of course, this has some effects on local communities, on families, on all kinds of relationships, because you don't longer belong there uh, if you want to have this kind of life. No, you go away and you design your own life with the persons you like. This process is going on. And then, given the said there's disembedding and you have re-embedding. So you have the disembedding from the traditional uh, uh, networks and, and social structures, and there's a re-embedding in all kinds of new, liquid, fluid, light, communities that you want to be part of. Okay, so this is also individualization in our time. And I believe it's also happening here. It's happening everywhere we can communicate and, uh, and find, uh, find new friends. Okay, these are three forces undermining, let's say, a sort of moral commitment. The last one is the moral commitment to our communities that we come from. Yeah, so the moral commitment to the communities we come from, uh, parents, families, etc., weakens um, because we think we can find a better life together with others, a self-designed life that we want, that we like, that we choose. Uh, so this has moral implications. And I believe we are now just starting to think about this because this is our world, this is our internet world, this is our information society. As we start to think about this, what this means. And therefore, also, in our time, we start to think again about communities, about the common good, the things that we can share, the moral life that we want to share. Therefore, we are here today because we are concerned about these kinds of things. Therefore, we come together because we think, how can we reshape, rebuild community in a world like this, where we forgot our moral basis? What are the effects? It's interesting to see all these uh, Portuguese for me. Efeitos sociais. Efeitos sociais, yeah? Oh, okay, next one. Yeah. Um, so, I'm now going to show some effects and then I believe we will have coffee and after coffee we will go on. But uh, I show some effects. Um, first, is what they call that relations become thin. So you can have thick relations and you can have, can have, can have 
thin relations. Thick relations are normally the relations that you have, let's say, between parents and children. Because they encompass the whole life of someone. We are interested in the whole person. Therefore, we have a thick relationship, or with your wife, or lifelong friend, or whatever. There are thick relations, and in this relationship, we want to be faithful, we want, we want to be good, we want to be helpful, we want to be a moral person for someone else. And, but we get more thin relationships, uh, with no moral obligations, just inter-individual, because we need someone, it's a sort of instrumentalizing contact, we need someone for a certain pur purpose, and then we, we go, we go further. So many relations become thin in such a world. Uh, so we, we don't feel we have a moral obligation. We can go on. We can go our own way. And, and in a way, it's, it's also easy to have only thin relations because you can go your own way. Until the point that you are left by everyone and you are lonely. And so that's the effect of this thinness, that no one, in the end, will feel moral obligations towards you. So we cannot do in our world without thick relations. This I'm going to talk after the break. <coughs> but this is one effect. Another one is disintegration and exclusion. Um, someone said, we see from modernity to late modernity, I see your world now as a late modern world, there's a movement from an inclusive to an exclusive society. So what we sense now is that we move from an inclusive society uh, where everyone is embraced, can be part of the community, to an exclusive society, where we exclude others. I believe this is in Europe much stronger, but I'm not sure. It's, it's dangerous to say this, but I, I think that in Europe this is really going on. Polarization between newcomers and old inhabitants. Immigrants com, com, coming in, not being accepted. Um, people from different backgrounds now suddenly no longer accepted. Uh, even when they live for decades already in Western countries, now there is a sort of sharpness coming in the discussion saying, you, you don't belong here, go back to your own, own country. But also exclusion on the labor market. Exclusion uh, because we think someone is useless, he has no economic worth. So what to do with people who have no economic worth? Eh? So in our time that we count and we measure, at the end we say, okay, he has so much economic worth, it's not enough. Uh, we, we, we don't go, we, we don't use you. you. You're not longer useful for, for society. That kind of exclusion is also going on. And a new kind of ra racism coming up now. Um, in, a, in Europe and also in North America. So, um, and of course this has to do with disintegration. It has to do with thinner relations. It has to do with that we are strangers for one, becoming more and more strangers for one another. Also moral strangers for one another. We don't understand the values of someone else and we don't want to understand it either, so we are going to throw away. So that's an effect. Um, the third effect is interesting. This distrust or lack of confidence. I already pointed to the two sides of it: the lack of trust in, let's say, in personal relationships. I don't trust you. Social trust. Eh, that's the term. And um, they say that so social trust, that's when you trust people also that are not family of yourselves. So normally you trust your family, you know what kind of sheep you have <laughs> in, uh, when you have family, eh? all kinds of colors, but you know the, the sheep of that uh, herd. But um, uh, do you also trust others? That's the question. Do you trust people who are not your family? And uh, hopefully, hopefully, we have societies where you can also trust others who are not a member of your family. And you can do your, your trade, you can do your business with everyone in good trust, that they will not betray you, they will, will not, etc. I think in, 
in terms of corruption, it's, it's an important topic, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, this gets social trust, and you have public confidence. Public confidence regards more confidence in the institutions, right? the institutions, political institutions, economic institutions. Do they what they are designed for? Is there a sort of morality in it that we can understand? Or are these amoral things? When we had this financial crisis 10 years ago, the people became aware of what was going on in the, in the banking institutions. And they said, do, do these people of the banks have no morals anyhow? Right? So um, institutions should embody somehow moral capital. Right? Not only financial capital, but also moral capital. I'm going to talk about moral capital later. So, but the, the, the confidence in public institutions is enormous, is of enormous importance also for your work. And perhaps you are also, uh, sometimes you find yourself in conversations that people express this lack of confidence in institutions. And what are you going to say? What's your idea about this? What's your policy? And then, uh, yeah, this is uh, also an important one. Um, in a world where we don't trust one another, in a world where relations are becoming thinner, uh, when when we have when we consider others as perhaps or even our enemies, yeah, we need contracts. Um, but now I approach it a little negative because contract can be a normal way to make an agreement between an employer and an employee, between who want, someone who wants to buy and someone who wants to sell. There's no problem with that, but it's not a model for all our social relationships. It's a model for, let's say, for things that we do in trade, or perhaps sometimes we do in politics. But sometimes I think, and it's also analysis in my book, that uh, we have made, every, we turned everything in, so, in social sphere into a contract. And contracts always between two people who have to bridge the gap between them. There is a richer idea about being community, being a moral community, than living in a contract. But I'm going to talk about that after the break. I see now sort of television presenta presentator. <laughs> see you back after the break. But it's, uh, I'm looking to the leadership here. Yeah? Yeah, stop here and then, OK. So it was my first lecture. <laughs>